Good evening, I am Xavier Salomon, the Deputy Director and Peter J. Sharp Chief Curator at the Frick Collection in New York. Welcome to this 20th and last episode of Travels with a Curator. We've traveled all over the Western world, mo mostly through Europe. Uh, we've been as far away as Hawaii and Palestine. We've been to Italy, Spain, France, the United Kingdom. We've been to Germany. but. Today, uh, for this last episode, I would like to travel to our sister institution, not so far away from New York, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Of course, Pittsburgh is the center of the industrial development of the United States in a number of ways. Uh, in the late 19th century, this was really the industrial heart of the US. But I will travel there to visit uh, Henry Clay Frick's house and the museum that has uh, been created around it, the Frick Pittsburgh, which in many ways, as I said, it's our sister institution in, from New York. We will look at the man, we will look at Henry Clay Frick, and this is the bust by Malvina Hoffman, which actually exists in three versions. This is the one at the Frick Pittsburgh, Another bust is at the Frick Collection in New York, and the third is in the Frick Building, the business building where Frick worked in downtown Pittsburgh. Of course, the life of Henry Clay Frick was linked to Pittsburgh from the very beginning, and most of his life was actually spent in the city. He was born not far away from Pittsburgh in uh, Westmoreland County uh, in the village, a small town of West Overton. This is the house that belonged to the Overholt family. And uh, the Overholt family were in the whiskey distillery business. And this is the family of Frick's mother. This is the rather grand house where they lived, where Frick's grandparents and mother uh, lived and grew up. And Frick was born just to the right of this building in this little spring house uh, the, it, probably on a winter day like this one, on the 19th of December, 1849. So growing up in this house and in West Overton, uh, Frick then moved into Pittsburgh as his business flourished and as he started working uh, in the coal and um, steel industry. He moved to New York in 1905. Already from 1902 onwards, the family was renting uh, apartments in New York, but in 1905, he permanently moves to New York. And this is where he will spend uh, the last years of his life, all the way to the 2nd of December, 1919, when Frick dies in New York, in the house we now know as the Frick Collection on Miami 70th Street. But importantly, he is buried back in Pittsburgh. And this is the Frick family pot plot in the, um, in the cemetery, not far away from the house where the family lived. And so this link, this very strong link with Pittsburgh always remained. I'm not going to talk today about Frick's life and business in Pittsburgh. Um, of course, this is something that goes um, hand in hand with a series of successes, financial successes through the steel and, um, and coal industry, but also is a story of great pain and great difficult uh, events, such as the uh, Homestead strike and uh, the, the treatment of workers in the steel factories uh, at the time of Frick and Carnegie in Pittsburgh. But today I would like to focus instead and to travel uh, to the complex we now know as the Frick Pittsburgh. And we have to go back to the beginning of the young Henry Clay Frick uh, as a young uh, millionaire who started collecting art already um, as a young man, as a bachelor. And here you see him in, a, in an early photograph. But what he bought to begin with is actually very different from what uh, he acquired when he was in New York and what we now have at the Frick Collection. And so in many ways, the Frick Pittsburgh represents the other side of the coin, so to speak, of Frick's collecting and Frick's life. And I always feel that really to get a full sense of Frick as a man and as a collector of his family life, of his collecting life, you have to really visit both museums. And they represent um, slightly different uh, views of, uh, of Henry Clay Frick. So to begin with, Frick actually bought 
American objects, uh, decorative arts mostly, um, of sort of luxurious brands like Tiffany. This is in fact a set that he acquired later in the 1890s, but these were the sort of objects that Frick started buying. And we know that from a very young age, he was interested in paintings, but we don't really know uh, what some of these very early purchases in terms of, uh, of uh, paintings or, or drawings may have been. In 1881, Frick marries um, Adelaide Howard Childs. And a year later, in 1882, uh, they buy their house in Pittsburgh. And what they buy is a large mansion in the east end of Pittsburgh, in the area known as Point Breeze. And this is a house that uh, was built in the 1860s, but Frick acquires it in August 1882 and moves in probably in 1883 and that he refurbishes drastically around that time, and then again in the 1890s. So the way we see it now is actually a result of that later uh, enlargement of the house. It's a house that changed and grew over time. We have to think that, of course, Frick and his family lived in this house from 1883 until 1905, for a much longer time than they lived in what we know as the Frick Collection or 170th Street, where they only really lived, I mean, Henry Clay Frick lived for about four or five years between 1915 and 1919 uh, 19 when he died. So this was the core of the family life. And that is why it's such an important building, uh, even for us at the Frick Collection, because so much goes back to Clayton. So the house is enlarged, it's renamed Clayton by, by the Frick family and Frick's children are born here, and he spends most of his business life in Pittsburgh living in this house. What is he buying while he's living at Clayton? So, of course, he's buying American decorative arts, uh, but he's also buying um, other works. And what we can see in the house is not just his collecting, but also uh, a more private side of Frick and his family. The house is a very grand house. So when you walk through its rooms today, you get a sense of this grandeur, but this is very much the house, sort of late 19th century American wealthy house with the wood paneling, with the mostly American furniture and uh, the chandelier in this case and decorative arts. This is the great dining room, uh, but also here you see uh, one of the living halls, uh, one of the sitting rooms in the, in the house uh, with Frick's um, study. This, of course, is a much more lived in house than the Frick collection as we know it. What happened is when the Frick was, was transformed into a museum in New York uh, between the death of Adelaide Frick and the opening of the museum in 1935, so we're looking at the first half of the 1930s, the house was turned into a museum. So so everything that made the house look like a house, all the personal belongings, the photographs, uh, were all moved back to the original family house at Clayton. And that was always kept by the Frick family as the main family home, while the Frick in New York was transformed into a museum. So a lot of the material that is at the Frick Pittsburgh, in terms of photographs, in terms of personal belongings, is material that we don't have at the Frick in New York. And here in this sort of cluttered, um, sense of this house, you get the, the, the feeling of the combination of artwork, sculpture, paintings, drawings, but also the family photographs, the books, the mementos, the letters, all the material um, of Frick and his wife and his children. A lot of the, the Clayton decoration in many ways is a precursor to Wani 70th Street. And even though the taste is a very different taste, by the time Frick moves to New York, the taste has shifted to a much more European classical um, uh, idea. And of course, the Frick's interiors in New York were decorated by White and Allum, the firm that was also redecorating Buckingham Palace for the King of, of England. Uh, but here you see that this idea of sort of dark paneling, uh, the marble fireplace, the fabric on the walls, uh, the combination of decorative arts and paintings, in many ways, you already get a glimpse of this in Clayton in the, the early 1890s, looking ahead to the Frick in the 19-teens in New York. The house at Clayton had, as one would expect for a wealthy house of that time, all the latest gadgets. So it had, uh, for example, this very fancy shower. Uh, but what we see walking through the house is all of these personal belongings. And what I love about going through Clayton is this feeling of 
walking into somebody's house uh, as if the person had just left. And, and, and you see all the photographs. These are two photographs of Frick as a young man and later in life. Uh, but there are also family portraits. And, and so the works of art at Clayton are not just great old master paintings or modern art, but they're also um, fa family uh, images. So this is a rather lovely portrait of Charles Frick, Frick's uh, son, as, as a kid. But there is also this, which I, I love particularly, which is a painting by Charles Frick. So the drawings, the paintings by the children are also there at Clayton. There are cars. And in the 1990s, uh, as part of the Frick Pittsburgh, um, uh, car, and, car, car and Carriage Museum was created, which displays a number of cars and carriages which belonged to the Frick family and were kept at Clayton, but also other period cars. And so here, again, you get a sense of uh, how the family moved and, and the, the vehicles they used uh, from the 1880s onwards. And there are mementos of other ways of transportation. Uh, one of my favorite is the China service for the Westmoreland. And Westmoreland, of course, is the area of West Overton, where Frick was born, where the family originated. But uh, the Westmoreland was also Frick's private train. And every summer, Frick would travel from Pittsburgh to Massachusetts to the beach house of Eagle Rock, which was being built in the early 1900s. And the train, of course, doesn't exist anymore, but the Frick Pittsburgh still has the service for the train and uh, part of the, the fabric that went in the train to decorate this private family train. When you look at some of the things at Clayton, like this uh, briefcase, for example, you also realize that many of these things actually were not made necessarily for Clayton, but come from New York. And so here's this briefcase belonging to Frick with one East 70th Street on it. So, as I said, what happened in the 1930s when so much of the personal belongings, all of the personal belongings were moved back from New York to Pittsburgh means that all of the family personal objects are still to be seen at the Frick Pittsburgh rather than at the Frick collection. And I find this particularly interesting. The Frick Pittsburgh has a great collection of clothes. All of the family clothings and other period clothes um, are displayed at the Frick and preserved at the Frick Pittsburgh we don't have a single piece of clothing from the family in New York. Uh, this I always find very touching when I go to Clayton, and this is in Mr. Frick's bedroom, his slippers. And these are slippers with which he probably would have walked around 170th Street. But again, in the 1930s, they traveled back to, uh, to Pittsburgh. So many of the objects that would have inhabited 170th Street are in fact now in Pittsburgh. Frick as a collector um, started very early on and his very first old master painting that we know of is a rather surprising work, is this Jan van Os um, still life, a rather Baroque exuberant painting, very much unlike anything else he acquired later on or anything else we have at the Frick collection in New York. But this seems to have been a bit of a one-off and Early on, Frick in the 1880s and 1890s focuses his collecting of paintings and, and, and works of art mainly on more or less contemporary art, on the Barbizon School, the French school of landscape painting, uh, Rousseau, Millet, uh, Corot, all of these artists. And the great collection of these works, even though we have an, a, a series of examples of them at the Frick in New York, most of them are still in Pittsburgh. This is a very beautiful Rousseau uh, landscape. The Frick Pittsburgh also has the large collection of staggering Millet drawings that Frick collected. And uh, we have a Millet uh, painting at the Frick in New York, but these great, great drawings uh, are all in Pittsburgh. And of course, there are other types of contemporary art, not just the Barbizon School, uh, but this is the Monet painting uh, painted in 1879, which shows the banks of the Seine at Lavacour. This was acquired by Frick in 1901, so before he moved to New York, and it's still there in Pittsburgh. Uh, but it gives you a sense of, of the fact that he was acquiring what was effectively then, Barbizon School and Impressionism, contemporary art. This had only been painted 20 years before uh, Frick acquired it. And um, these paintings sit at Clayton together with some old masters. And Frick's early passion for old masters focused mainly on British 18th century portraiture. 
And of course, when we think of the collection in New York, the great Gainsboroughs and, and, and Reynolds and Romneys, Hockner and Beachy, I mean, this is a great part, very important part of the collection at 170th Street. But even at Clayton, this is very much so. So this is a portrait, uh, a set of portraits, pendant portraits by Reynolds of Sir George uh, Beaumont and Lady Beaumont. Sir George Beaumont was um, one of the people who was fundamental for the creation of the National Gallery in London, uh, still considered one of the great founders of that institution. Uh, but this is his portrait by Reynolds, which Frick acquires and displays at Clayton. And even though many of these works, even some of the ones we have in New York, were acquired in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, Frick continued collecting in this, in this area all the way to his death. And the very last Gainsborough he acquired, uh, this very beautiful portrait of uh, Richard Brinsley Sheridan, the playwright, politician, lawyer um, in, in, in England in the 18th century, who was uh, very good friends with, with Gainsborough, and who married uh, one of the Lindley sisters. Uh, there are many portraits by, by Gainsborough of the Lindley sisters and, and Sheridan and, and their family. Uh, this was the last Gainsborough Frick acquired in 1918, just a year before his death in New York. But there are also French works uh, at the Frick Pittsburgh. And, and just to give you an example of two things which could equally be at the Frick in New York, this is a wonderful Natier portrait of uh, Maria Lechinska, uh, the Queen of France. She was the daughter of the King of Poland who marries Louis XV. Uh, and a wonderful uh, piece of furniture by Martin Carlin. And there are, there are a series of, of pieces of furniture by him, both in Pittsburgh and New York. So in many ways, there is an overlap between what is at Clayton and what is in New York, but also some main differences. And what we need to think about and, 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 and consider is that one of the important figures for the creation of the Frick Pittsburgh but really in many ways also for the Frick in New York, is Frick's daughter, Helen Clay Frick. Here you see Helen Clay as a young woman, uh, but Helen Clay was born and grew up at Clayton and always considered that the family home. And even though she then spent most of her adult life in New York, she always returned to Clayton, she always kept the house running, she would always go back for periods of time. And in fact, she moved back there in her later life and um, she spent the last few years of her life at Clayton and died there in 1984. Helen Clay collected paintings and some of the things she acquired were very much in the footsteps of her father. This is a beautiful little sketch by Fragonard for the progress of love, which of course is now at the Frick Collection, which is something that Helen Clay acquired fairly early on in 1922 and, and, and kept. But she also bought things that were very different from what her father acquired. So within the sort of school of French painting, for example, this is a very beautiful uh, Lenin painting by one of the Lenin brothers. Uh, this sort of scene of peasant, a peasant family, something very unlike what Frick would have been interested in. And um, Helen Clay really purchases some, some great masterpieces um, also in a very different direction from her father. This is most evident in her passion for gold grounds. All of the gold grounds at the Frick in New York come from Helen Clay's purchases uh, as the head of the acquisition committee at the Frick and as a trustee. And she got the museum in New York to, to purchase and she donated many gold grounds to our collection. But a big chunk of her collection of gold grounds is now in Pittsburgh. This is the very beautiful Sassetta, a Sienese um, gold ground painter. Uh, there are in fact two Sassettas at, uh, at Pittsburgh. Uh, this is a very, very beautiful virgin and child with the angels um, sort of crowning her. But there are also more uh, rare works of art. This is uh, a triptych from 1265, which is by a very rare artist from Central Italy, Reinaldo di Rainuccio from Spoleto, da Spoleto, uh, with the Virgin and Child uh, enthroned in the center again and scenes from the Passion of Christ on the uh, outer wings. So Helen Clay was really a connoisseur when it came to gold grounds and didn't just buy great works by Duccio and Cimabue 
o Gentile da Fabriano, but she also bought uh, works by lesser known artists. And some of the very interesting ones are at the Frick in Pittsburgh. So Helen Clay becomes uh, the key figure in many ways for Pittsburgh because she is the one that inherits the house uh, after Frick's death and basically uh, runs the house all the way to her death in 1984. Clayton remains a private, oh, privately owned house all the way to Miss Frick's death. But at the same time, she decides to create a museum in Pittsburgh on the grounds of her childhood home. And so just, you know, a few minutes away from, from Clayton, she builds this museum, the Frick Art Museum, which opens in 1970. And the Frick Art Museum is meant to be uh, a museum a bit like the Frick Collection. As you can see, the architecture is very reminiscent of that classical language, architectural language of the Frick in New York. But this is where she uh, decided to display part of her own collection and her father's collection, some of the objects that she had inherited. Uh, so this opened to the public in 1970. And we have to remember that, of course, the house nearby was still private all the way to 1984. And it was only in 1990 that the house Clayton finally opened to the public. So in the 1990s, this complex of different buildings, the Frick Art Museum, Clayton, the house, then later on the creation of the Cars and Carriages Museum, all of this is now the large compound that we know as the Frick Pittsburgh. And of course, we really need to think of, as the, uh, of the Frick Pittsburgh as much as the Frick collection as a double creation, the creation of Henry Clay Frick and of Helen Clay Frick. Without the two of them, the collections would not look the way they do today. And of course, the importance for us in New York of the creation of the Frick Art Reference Library, that's directly related uh, to Helen Clay Frick, who founded it after her father's death in the 1920s. So this double portrait, in a way, um, encapsulates uh, the, the combination of this extraordinary man, collector, and this extraordinary woman, a forceful woman who really believed in her father's legacy and continued that in a number of fascinating and important ways all the way to her death fairly recently in 1984. So with this episode of Travels, we travel the closest we have to New York City. We travel only to Pennsylvania. But I think it's worth thinking about the importance of, of the Frick Pittsburgh for us and the relationship between our two institutions. And I very much hope that all of you out there who love the Frick Collection will have time to also visit the Frick Pittsburgh and think about this different aspect of Frick's and Helen Clay Frick's collecting, but also their uh, their family life and how you really get a sense of uh, father and daughter and the other members of the family inhabiting Clayton when you visit it today. I would like to thank you all for having joined uh, Amy and me on this incredible journey through 20 places that are connected in some way or another to the Frick Collection or to works of art at the Frick. Uh, it's been several difficult months through this pandemic, through uh, everything that is happening in the world right now, as most of us uh, cannot travel as extensively as we would wish for, uh, this is a way to explore these places virtually, but of course, inviting all of you to eventually visit, if you can, when you can, all of these places, some of my favorites, some of Amy's favorites, but so many places that are directly linked with the Frick. The Frick is not just the museum on 170th Street, but is a much broader network of objects and places and, and great works of art and colleagues all over the world. And of course, Amy and I spend most of our working time connecting to other places, to other museums, to other colleagues, to other friends. And here I would like to thank you all for having joined us, for following us um, so um, so um, fondly over the last uh, few months. And I would like to thank also all of the colleagues that helped both Amy and me uh, gathering information on all these places and traveling virtually to all these places. And finally, I hope to welcome you all soon uh, to a new temporary home on Madison Avenue as the Frick Collection uh, will reopen there very soon. Thank you and look forward to seeing you all soon.